when, when my dad would be uh, upset or mad or had a bad day, you know, I mean, he worked like crazy, you know, hard, hard work, you know, and then we had these kids at home, we were raising Cain, you know, <laughs> and, and uh, he'd just kind of get quiet. And you felt it, you know. <laughs> he could say a million things without saying exactly. anything at all. Exactly. That's dead. Yeah. But it came to teaching. He never once told us to practice. Not one time I could ever remember him saying. You just you, did it on your own. You need to practice. You just, he just, you just kind of knew you, you wanted to be better for him. Six months. He went Six from months. Not playing mandolin at all. Yes. To playing in a band. Yeah. Yep. Did he, you feel in over your head or were you confident? Oh yeah, I, I was totally over my head. And I, but my dad didn't have a mandolin player in the band. And all I did was he taught me to just to play rhythm, you know, just like a, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And um, play just a few little solo things. And that's how it started for me, you know, sink or swim, I always say that. And these guys were old guys, they're all in their late 30s, you know. Yeah. <laughs> How old were you again at this 14. point? 14. You're 14, no yeah. big deal. <laughs> Tonight, this is not a normal night necessarily, you're playing three, you're playing a set, yeah. Jeff Austin Band's playing a set, and then y'all are playing uh, a set of Grateful Dead music. That's right. Talk to me about your introduction to the Grateful Dead, and okay. what your dad think about the Grateful Dead? Well, okay. Uh, wow. Mine, mine goes back to when I was a teenager, and, uh, and I had friends that uh, weren't necessarily into bluegrass at all. And I, my hero, one of my absolute heroes is David Grisman. So I had known about Olden in the Way and had that, but I didn't know about the Grateful Dead as much as I knew that, them. And so... To you, the Grateful Dead was Jerry's side project. Exactly. To what, to what you exactly were into. Exactly right, you know. And I say that a lot because I tell people from the stage when we do these shows that most of the folks in the audience came to the kind of music we play through Garcia and the Grateful Dead by a band called Older Than Away. And I came to, <laughs> to the Grateful Dead <laughs> through David Grisman and Older Than Away. You know, it's just a, a little different. And so I... Uh, you know, I, I had to kind of discover this, what they're talking about, and um, I'm such a David Grisman fan, I had everything he did and wanted to know everything about him, and, and then I had some buddies who were into the Grateful Dead, and they, we went to shows, so I went to quite a few shows. I did all the D.C. and Philadelphia shows is what mainly I did. It was so different from pop radio and all that stuff, you know, that I was hearing in the 80s especially, you know. Even though I liked some of that, the first show I ever went to at a rock concert was Rush. And uh, I was about 16. I couldn't believe the music coming out of three guys. <laughs> well, Neil Peart counts as like six, but yeah. yeah. He does, you're right. <laughs> it's funny, I took my two sons to their first rock concert. It was Rush. Oh, yeah? So, yeah, I we're got like, to do Dad, that. <laughs> we're, we're, what is this? No, they loved it. They absolutely <laughs> loved it, you know. Uh, by the time I was 21, I've been playing a lot with David, and David uh, lived on the West Coast, we were on the East Coast, and he had a thing he put together called the Bluegrass Experience, which was basically my dad's band with him. And we did a lot of touring for a year, and uh, just got so tight with David, and, and David, uh, I was playing a kind of a cheaper mandolin that I had, and David said, hey man, I got a mandolin for you at home. And I didn't say anything, I didn't, I didn't know what to say. And my dad went out maybe a month later and did something with him, I wasn't along. He comes back with his mandolin. So that's the one I'm playing tonight, you know. I was 21 and he... That was Christmas mandolin. Yeah, he gave it to me, yeah, when I was 21. And that's the type of guy he is. He's a wonderful, wonderful man. He's that's beautiful. very generous, you know. I'm not the only guy he's done that for, you know. And uh, to me, the, the, the best maker in the world right now uh, is Stephen Gilchrist, and he made that mandolin for him. And David told me the story on it. It's 1981. He said he, he was living in Mill Valley at the time, and he said, I got, a, I got a note in the mail on my birthday to go down to the post office. There's a package there. And this fellow's from Australia. 
It's Gilchrist. And he said, I got down there and here's a mandolin. And it's made for me and it was on my birthday. And uh, I asked some of the guys in the band at the time too, because he never played it much. You know, he has great instruments, but he never played it that much. And it was like a new instrument. A lot of guys don't like new, you know. That break in hand. Yeah. So, and by the time I got it, it was, it was only seven or eight years old, but uh, the neck was coming out of it. The glue had given away, and I had a guy repair it for me, and I've played it ever since, and a lot of people really like the sound of this instrument, you know, but it's from playing it. You know, dry and, you know. Going through different temperatures and exactly. traveling in it, different rooms. That does it, I think, to me. I mean, you can keep one pristine, never take it out, never do all this stuff, or you can, I, it's a tool for me. Uh, long about 1989 and 90, uh, he had rekindled his friendship with Jerry. They had kind of parted ways for a long time and uh, Jerry was off doing the, the dead and going everywhere and David was creating his own music, dog music. So they got back together and started making music and recording and, and uh, you know, I'd call out to his house and talk to him and he'd say, hey man, let me here, put you on the phone. And Garcia would come on the phone, you know, <laughs> and I'd, I'd start just talking to him a little bit. Didn't know what to say. I was just 20 years old, you know. So what did you say? You know, <clears throat> actually, before I got on the phone with him, I met him because I was in Washington, D.C. We played on the mall, a two week national folk festival, and it was put on by this guy that kind of ran the stage we were at by Tom Venom. Tom Venom uh, worked at, at the Smithsonian, and he was a musicologist, and he wrote some books on drumming. Okay. And he would go to Haiti and study all these Haitian drums and record them. And he'd go around the world and do this. Well, Mickey Hart found him, and they became big buddies. So we're at the mall playing, and uh, he said, hey, do you know this band, The Grateful Dead? And I said, yeah. Heard of them? Uh, yeah, yeah. He said, I, I said, I went to see him before, you know. And he said, you want to meet Jerry? And I was like, yeah, sure, you know, 20 years old, <laughs> 21. And so he hooked it up because he, they were all, he was intertwined with them. And sure enough, we got, uh, it was in D.C. at the Cap Center. And... We, you know, meet me back here and we get the passes and we go back into the bowels of the Cap Center and Jerry's sitting on stage, on the stage already. There's a cubby hole that's just, but has all these, just made a square hole for him. It's where he sat. And you couldn't see it from anywhere, you know, but it was, he was in there. David's really uh, a brilliant uh, man that knows about instruments. And I knew that he was buying and selling instruments. He's really good at that. He's one of the greatest in America, you know. Everybody knows acoustic instruments that David knows his stuff. He can identify what's Everything. a good instrument. Everything. Yeah. He knows, you know, he basically knows the value. He's studied it all, you know. He's had hundreds and hundreds of mandolins go through his hands. And other instruments, guitars, banjos, mainly what he focuses on. So I read the paper in my little hometown. Uh, I was in Shrewsbury, Pennsylvania, and this says, says for sale, two banjos, you know. I said, all right, I'm, I'm gonna see if I can buy these, and man, I'll just sell them, you know. I will get into this and make extra money because, you know, like I said, we didn't work a whole lot. I go and buy these banjos. And I first person I called was David. I said, David, I bought these banjos. This is what they are. Uh, do you have any idea what they're worth? And he says, you know, he tells me a, a price, you know. And uh, he says, right in the same phone call, you know who might want like those is Garcia. And I said, oh, really? <laughs> I said, well, <laughs> I've got them. <laughs> He said, let me call him. So he sets this up, and next thing you know, uh, 
They're coming back east to the cap center. It was a cap center again. And uh, I'm on, it's funny, I was on the phone with this guy who used to work for the dead. He lived in Rochester, New York, Dave Burness. And he would travel on the East Coast and kind of work with the organization, you know, in the 70s. And I'm on the phone with him and I had call waiting. And I punch it over and it's Jerry Garcia. <laughs> he said, hey, Ronnie, this is Jerry Garcia. I said, well, how you doing? <laughs> I was like, that, 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 that. You know, I didn't know what to say. I said, can I put you on hold? <laughs> you put Jerry Garcia on hold? I did. I can't believe I did it now, but I did because I got back on. What's I said, wrong with you? I said, he said, oh, yeah, sure, man. You know, and uh, I, I get back on the line. I said, Dave, you won't believe it. it's Jerry Garcia. All right, I gotta get off the phone. <laughs> so, I, so I talked to Jerry and we hook it up and go down to the Capitol Center and I took my dad. Uh, my brother went with me, my wife went with me, my sister went with me because my sister and my dad had never seen the show. So we went down and uh, we, I could hear him on stage finishing up the sound check. And um, they came down, and Hornsby was in the band at the time. And we just met in catering and sat there and for like an hour and a half. And he and my dad kind of rekindled there because in 1972, David came east to a bluegrass festival my dad was at. And he came up to my dad and he said, I want to introduce you to my new banjo player in my band and his name's Jerry Garcia. So that was 1972, and this was 1990, 90, so 20 years, you know, had passed. And they talked about a lot of, uh, you know, the older generation bluegrass music, and, and Jerry was just, you know, you could tell that he looked up to my dad, you know, because he was younger, and, uh, he was just talking about all kinds of musical things, and he knew that I, I, uh, you know, liked his band, The Grateful Dead, and because he turned to me and he said, "I want you to know that your dad was a big inspiration for me hmm. playing music." You know, I was just like, "Boy, I gotta put my chest out." Got all proud. <laughs> I did, man. I was beaming, <laughs> and uh, we had a great visit. I, but long story short, he bought these banjos. He picked them a little bit, and then I get a check. You know, he took them with him, and I get a check in the mail. <laughs> From Jerry Garcia? No, no. Grateful Dead Productions. Well, just as good. Do yeah. You, have, you still yeah. have the check? I have a copy of it. Yeah. I needed the money. If you could go back in time or into the future, where would you want to go? What would you want to see? You can go back wow. or forward. Wow. Absolutely, I would have loved to have seen uh, what we do. Bill Monroe, Lester Flatt and Earl Scruggs. Chubby Wise was a fiddle player and the ba bass player was Cedric Rainwater. And these guys created the sound of bluegrass. I would have loved to have seen uh, that band, the original bluegrass band. And then of course, you know, what, what the frenzy of Elvis and the frenzy of the Beatles and Hendrix, I mean, we got to really work on this time machine. <laughs> no, we got a lot of music to go see. <laughs> I would have loved to have seen the Almond Brothers at their absolute peak early. Right? You know, man, that, Are you that an Almonds fan? Oh, yeah, man. I mean, my brother, the first things that we probably steered away from bluegrass was the Almond Brothers. Really? Yeah. What did it for you? What was, was there a song or, or a record? Yeah, it was all, you know, um, Born a Ramblin' Man. That, that had a lot of what we do in it. Yeah. You know, I had the bluegrassy feel to me and my brother. He, we both loved it. And then the twin guitars, loved it. You Couldn't know. beat those twin guitars. No, no, you know. And I've never met Dickie Betts. Uh, I spent about an hour with Greg Allman before in, in New York and talked to him quite a bit about different things. Because I told him I'm from Nashville and they, they were born in Nashville. And I said something to him. He said, yeah. I never did like that twangy stuff. Hey, do you know this band, The Grateful Dead? 